Hello and welcome to the MMA live chat show. I'm Rich Daly and it's Wednesday, May 21st, 2014. On today's show, we'll be discussing the UFC 173 Burrell versus Dillashaw event. We'll give our predictions for the main card and maybe we'll do a final thoughts segment if time allows. On today's show, we have yours truly, Damon Gazelle, and Jeremiah Deskins. Thanks for taking part in another show, guys. I appreciate you all taking time to be here and joining me to discuss the UFC 173 Burrell versus Dillashaw event and for taking the time to share your predictions. Go ahead and say hello to anybody that might be listening, guys. Thanks for having me, Rich. Good to see you, Jeremiah. Thanks for having me. Good to see you guys. All right, guys. Thanks again for being here. Okay, let's go ahead and get started here. UFC 173 Burrell versus Dillashaw taking place 10 p.m. Eastern Time, Saturday, May 24th, 2014, on pay per view at the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. Up first, we're going to discuss the main event Hannon Burrell versus TJ Dillashaw, the Bantamweight champ versus the number four UFC ranked Bantamweight fighter for the UFC Bantamweight title. Comments and your fight predictions, Damon. Uh Brown, definitely. Uh, I think he's actually going to submit Dillashaw in round two. Um, you know, uh, if you watch Brown's fighting, uh, he, he has no fear of, of wrestlers. He will actually try and wrestle them. Um, I just think Dillashaw is uh, stepping up to too much. I mean, I hope the best for the guy, but, you know, it is MMA, so anything can happen, but I just I think he's way outmatched in this matchup. Jeremiah? Yeah, I basically agree with everything Damon said. Uh, especially you've seen what Burrell did to Faber. Faber's a big step up for Dillashaw. I mean, you know, but like Damon said, he has no fear of wrestlers. He has the skill, and he's just a madman. He don't give a shit, man. He's going to go right in there, and I actually got him winning TKO in the second. Okay, well, I'm in agreement with both of you guys. And I'm even in more agreement with Jeremiah as well, because I'm going to go with the, the TKO and two for Burrell. I mean, as expected, Hannah Burrell is a huge favorite by both fans and odds makers. And although I will be rooting for Dillashaw, like you guys said, I just think Burrell's experience and his wins over better talent are just going to be too big of an obstacle for Dillashaw to overcome. So that's why I'm going to go with Burrell to win by TKO and two. Any more comments on that one? I just can't wait to see it. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what Dillashaw can do against him. I mean, Dillashaw, he, he's not a chump, but, I mean, he's he's stepping up to a whole nother level, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, and the experience differential between the two fighters is just dramatic. Any more comments on that one? No, yeah, I'm pretty sure we'll come back. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next one. We have the co-main event, Daniel Cormier versus Dan Henderson. The number four UFC ranked light heavyweight fighter versus the number six UFC ranked light heavyweight fighter. And this should be an interesting fight. Comments and your fight prediction through this one, Dana? I think it's going to be less interesting than you think. Uh, they're both um, Olympic wrestlers. I think that's uh, what Cormier is going to use is his wrestling against Henderson. And I think youth will actually uh, win the fight by a decision. I think Cormier is just going to be able to uh, use his stamina and his wrestling abilities to pretty much uh, control Henderson for the fight. But there's right. always that one chance. You know, yeah. Hendo, the one shot's all Hendo needs. I actually don't think it's going to go that far. I got DC in the first. I just think it's going to overwhelm him. <clears throat> Basically seeing him throwing him around like a rag doll, just from what Hendo looked like in his last fight with Shogun. I mean, we're not going to see him in the cage much longer. And DC's a beast, man. Coming down to light heavyweight, you've seen what he's done to heavyweight fighters. I can just imagine. Really didn't get to see much of a test in his last fight. That was a fucking fluke. But like Damon said, Hendo's got the right hand. I mean, you know, it's going to be real interesting. This is a fight. I don't know how it's going to work. I got DC TKO in the first. I see a ref stoppage. Ground if I am. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. I think it's going to overwhelm him at the gate. Yeah, I'm kind of like along the same lines as you guys there. I love Dan Henderson. He's my favorite of the two fighters there. But, you know, Daniel Cormier is a massive favorite by both fans and odds makers. 
and that's even more so than the Burrell Dillashaw matchup. And I'd normally go with Hendo for the win, but this is Hendo's first fight without a TUE for TRT. And typically, after fighters leave the TRT on the shelf, they usually don't fare too well in the first fight coming out of that scenario. And even though Hendo is my personal favorite between these two guys, uh, you know, he's got more experience and, and everything else seems to favor him other than the fact that he's a bit older and the, and the TRT appears to be the issue for him. You know, it'll be interesting to see how well he fares without that, but uh, I'm going to also go with Daniel Cormier by decision. Any other comments? Not like that. Uh, just, I, I think uh, uh, Cormier is, is going to try and grapple as soon as possible and take away that chance for the that right hand uh, to to land. And I think he's just going to tire him out and... and and did pretty much what he did to Frank Mir, um, hold him and control him and win the fight. Yeah, he actually did an interview just recently where he said uh, he believes that his freestyle wrestling is going to, you know, be uh, you know more of an asset to him than Hendo's Olympic wrestling, I believe. Well, uh, Cormier was an Olympic wrestler as well. Yeah, you don't see Hendo use his wrestling much unless it's up against the cage. Yeah, again, if it wasn't for the fact that it was TRT, you know, no longer available to uh, Endo, I, I would be going with him. But I'm in agreement with you guys. I think Daniel Cormier wins this one. Not a big fan of Daniel Cormier. And I hate to see him get the win over Hendo like this because, you know, he just really hasn't been all that impressive to me with the talent that he's fought, and especially with that Cummins character that he fought last time. So well, He did have a bigger fight um, planned, but... That fell through. That's why the other guy stepped up. Yeah, but, it's not yeah, his. But, you know, again, how does he go from you know not ranked in that lightweight division, a light heavyweight division, to being ranked number what four or five, whatever he is now? That's because it's done by the the media. Yeah. Yeah, I think the media is on drugs or something when they do their. Yeah, know, but you got to I mean, when you start ranking fighters too, I mean, you have to look at. at where they came from. I mean, he was fighting heavyweights, you know. Yeah, but, yeah, but, I, but he's that, like what, twelve have, and 0, 13 and 0, something like that. I yeah, mean, that there really doesn't have any bearing on on the light heavyweight division. I mean, when you're fighting bigger guys, I mean, the uh, caliber. Cormier's and Cormier's got speed. I mean, it's going to yeah. translate well in, into light heavyweight. Yeah, I hope I hope uh, Hendo wins, but I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next one there. Jake Ellenberger versus Robbie Lawler, the number five UFC ranked welterweight fighter versus the number one UFC ranked welterweight fighter. And I think this one's going to be exciting and should probably provide some fireworks. Comments on that one, Damon? Yeah, I, initially I was thinking Ellenberger, but, um, I, you know, I like Lawler. Uh, he's an exciting fighter. I'm actually going to pick him by uh, TKO in round two. Yeah, it's going to be an awesome fight. I got Lawler by decision, but this could be a main event on any other car. Possibly this is going to be a fight of the night. I'm more excited to see this fight than any of the rest of them. Besides the D.C. Hendo fight, just something about that. That's a that's an odd matchup. But this Ellenberger-Lawler fight, this has got title implications. Like I said, it could be a main event on any other card. And a, who's the favorite in this fight? Ellenberger? No, Lawler. Lawler's the favorite. Yeah. Yeah, I got him. I got Lawler winning by decision. Yeah, it's not a real big uh, difference as far as the odds makers are concerned. Lawler's a slight favorite by the odds makers, but fans overwhelmingly are favoring Lawler. Um, Ellenberger's losses in the UFC are to top tier opponents, and being that Robbie Lawler is a a huge favorite of mine. I'm going to go with Robbie Lawler to win by TKO and two. I was thinking about Ellenberger too, but uh, I don't know. After the performance that he put on with uh, Hendricks there, I, I think he's going to have what it takes to uh, get the win over Ellenberger. Yeah, good performance against McDonald too. I mean, he's resurrected his career. He's always been one of my favorites, but I like Lawler. Yeah, because I remember back when you and I were on that other site, uh, the Canadian site, way back when, uh, he was back in the WEC. Yeah. I was always a fan of his. I always liked him. 
Yeah, I love them. Any more comments on this one? Sounds like we lost. Damon. No, I'm here. Oh, okay. All right, then let's move on to the next one then. Okay, Takia Mizugaki versus Francisco Rivera, the number six UFC ranked bantamweight versus the number ten UFC ranked bantamweight. Comments on this one, Damon? I, I've got uh, Mizugaki by decision. Um, both of them have a pretty good string of wins, um, but I think Mizugaki's got going to probably come in with a, a better game plan, and uh, he he does have more decision wins um I think he's just he's going to use use his uh, MMA smarts whatever you want to call it and, and actually uh drag it out all three rounds and, and get the victory. So am I? I got Rivera by decision uh, really just based on his striking basically I wasn't wanting to pick him for sub in the third but I see this going through a decision. Yeah, I uh, <clears throat> I looked at this too, and Zagaki uh, is a slight favorite by odds makers, um, but he's a huge favorite by fans. Mm -hmm. uh, Rivera likes to stand and bang, and 70% of his wins are by KO or TKO, but like Damon said, I don't believe that Mizugaki is going to take part in Rivera's game plan. I, I think this one's going to go with decision as well, and I'm also going with uh, Mizugaki to win by decision. Any more comments? Okay. All right, and then we have the last fight that we're going to be predicting in the first fight on the main card. Two fighters who are not ranked in the UFC's top 15 rankings in the lightweight division. We have the James Krause versus Jamie Varner, the number 39 ranked lightweight fighter versus the number 26 ranked lightweight fighter. Dan, how do you see this one going? I'm pretty much going to go by heart on this one go with Jamie Varner. Um, if you look at Krause's uh, record, I mean, he he hasn't really been fighting too terribly much. Um, I don't know, was he injured? No, he had, that, he had that issue with Bobby Green where Green needed him three times in the balls and, <laughs> and they gave the fight to uh, Bobby Green and stopped the fight. Yeah, he, he doesn't have a... A very a record of continuous fights to go off of, so it's it's kind of hard to predict that one. Uh, Barner, he's got a lot of losses, but I think he's got more more experience in the octagon coming in. Um, so I think that that's going to help him on that end. And I'm actually going to go with Varner on this one. I like the guy. Yeah, I actually got Varner KO in a second, just based on his experience and his striking. He has a lot of losses, but he's he he's give or take in any of his fights. Just based on his experience and his striking, I got him KO in the second. Uh, Damon, you didn't say how that one was going to finish. Oh, decision. I think it's going to be a decision. I guess I'm the contrarian here. Um, Ozmakers basically have this one as a flip of the coin, but MMA fans uh, have Varner as a huge favorite to win this one. Uh, both of these fighters have the majority of their wins by submission. James Krause has 13 submissions in his win column, which is 65% of his wins, with only two of his five losses by submission. Jamie Varner has 11 submissions in his win column, which is 52% of his wins, with only four of his nine losses by submission. And most of those submission losses come late in the fight. Varner seems to be going through a bit of a slump as of late, with a 1-3 record out of his last four fights, whereas... Other than that controversial loss to Bobby Green, which in my opinion should not have been a loss, as I mentioned earlier, uh, James Krause has been on an eight-fight win streak, so I'm going to be picking him to win by submission in three. Tell me how wrong I am on that one, guys. Well, it's going to be an exciting fight. Yeah. Just like Damon, I'm basically going on heart on this one. Yeah. Yeah, and even though Warner has, you know, fought the better talent in the UFC, his uh, – like I said, he's in, he's in a slump, man, and he's not really looking all that good as of late. So, as I said with James Krause, I, you know, I really don't think. Do you guys recall the fight where he was kneeing the balls three times by Bobby Green? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm sure I've seen him, but I don't know. Yeah, I just don't. don't I just don't think that should have been a loss. And I actually thought they were gonna, you know, either call him no contest or give the fight to uh, to Krause, but. 
you know, I actually thought that Kraus was supposed to be fighting after that fight there, but I, I don't know what happened if he did get hurt or what. But yeah, he's been out for a while, right, then. Yeah, uh, November yeah. 6, 2013 was the Bobby Green fight. Yeah. And then before that, he beat Sam Stout. And well, that was impressive. That was his UFC debut. Yeah. And then. That was actually when I interviewed him right after Sam Stout. And then it shows on the UFC site that his last fight was Ricardo Lamas back in 2009 in the WEC. So I don't know if he's been with. Has he been with another organization? Well, I'm hoping that he gets the win because uh, I'd like to see him get redemption and get back on the winning track after he was kind of uh, shortchanged in that last fight that he had. Any more comments on this one, guys? I don't really think there's anything else we need to speak about on that card. Just the main card there is all I wanted to cover. You guys want to talk about anything else? Uh, he was fighting for another organization, Resurrection Fighting Alliance. Mm. So he has been fighting. He just hasn't been fighting... Uh, the higher caliber UFC fighters. That was in between WEC and the UFC? Yeah. yeah. No, I don't know nothing about that. Yeah, I don't recall either. I mean, I actually did the interview with him, but that was last year sometime, and I don't recall his record exactly. Usually when I do the fighter interviews, I go through their whole career and bring it up to you know current time. And But that was a while ago. Mm. I, can't, I can't seem to keep track of everything like some MMA fans do. Some of these MMA fans you got today, they're like encyclopedias of MMA where they can just recall everything yeah. instantaneously. <laughs> okay, let's uh, go ahead and briefly discuss the Bellator 120 Rampage versus King Mo event. And I don't know if you guys actually saw it, but I thought it was a bit of a spectacle. I didn't see the whole event, but with Bellator's plans uh, for, I guess, King Mo and Chandler, and also Flamenco, there's probably a, a bit of a jumble there once again for that organization there because there was a couple of upsets on the main card on uh, Rampage winning that controversial decision on King Mo and Will Brooks defeating Michael Chandler by split decision and then Tito Ortiz putting a blemish on Bellator middleweight champion Alexander Flamenco with that fairly quick arm triangle choke submission that put Flamenco out cold and went out one at 227. I actually thought that uh, Schmeichel was winning that fight up until the takedown in the arm triangle choke, but uh, yeah. we'll talk about that one last. Let's talk about the, uh, the King Mo Rampage fight. Did you guys see that one? Yeah, I got to see it. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think uh, King Mo got the first round, but I think uh, Rampage had the last two. I think he uh, did a lot more damage. Um, was stopping a lot of King Mo's takedown attempts. Um, yeah, I just... I had uh, Rampage actually winning that one. Uh, 29-28. He just, he, <clears throat> huh? You have Rampage winning 29-28. Yeah. Yeah. I think he uh, won the second and third rounds. Did you see that one, Jeremiah? I didn't see it. I just read up on it. Uh, all I heard was Mo got several takedowns, but he really didn't do nothing after he took him down. But I seen what his face looked like, so I'm going to try to check it out today. Yeah, I actually did watch the fights, and I made some notes here. Uh, in round one, Mo shoots right away, gets the takedown. He did nothing with it, but remained on top. Um, he was on top of Rampage for about a minute and a half. Rampage gets the fight back to defeat. Mo gets Rampage up against the cage and gets another takedown fairly quickly. And a series of the same where Rampage gets up and taken back down with King Mo scoring points by landing knees while controlling the action. Uh, the last minute of the half of round one takes place on the feet with Rampage looking sloppy as he wildly swings at Mo, landing a couple of shots. Round one clearly belonged to King Mo, and I gave round one 10-9 King Mo. Uh, round two started with Rampage landing a shot that seems to stun Mo. Uh, Rampage continues stalking Mo, lands another couple of heavy shots, and again, he seems to hurt Mo within the first minute of the half. Mo clinches, tries for another takedown. Rampage tosses him aside like a rag doll. Early on in round two, it looked like it would be all Rampage Jackson, but Rampage started to fade after three minutes or so. And round two is where Rampage did the damage to Mo's face. It was a closer round than round one, but I gave round three to Jackson 10-9. And then I thought round three was actually pretty boring. I don't see how the argument can be made to score it in favor of Jackson. I actually scored round three 10-9 uh, King Mo, and I had that one scored 29-28 King Mo on my scorecard. I actually had to go watch that because uh, I saw the bitching and pissing and moaning that was going on about here about the decision 
And, uh, you know, knowing King Mo and the way that he bitches and pisses and moans, um, I kind of thought that maybe he was just talking shit. But when I watched the fight, um, I had to agree. I, I, I thought he got the win on that one. And uh, ultimately, Rampage Jackson won by unanimous decision with judges scorecards reading 29-28. 29-28 and 29-28. So the judges all saw it the way that Damon saw it. Yeah, I just I, it, octagon control, you know, is one of the things that comes in. I don't, I, you know, uh, King Mo didn't seem like he was really doing as enough in the third round to actually to win it in my eyes. I mean, like you said, it was a boring match. Uh, our boring round, but it's still I'm rampage was still landing shots. He wasn't you know doing as much damage as he was in the second, but I think he was doing more of the stalking, uh, and King Mo was doing more of the the going for takedowns, but not actually securing them or anything like that. Yeah, um, I don't know if you guys saw any of the after fight charades and all the bullshit going on with King Mo after that, but. Uh... He said uh, he's prepared to go elsewhere if Bellator can't show him respect. Um, and the way that he was carrying on about things, you could tell that his massive ego was severely bruised. And I don't know, his WWE shtick with uh, the crown and the chick holding the parasol over his head is just plain fucking silly to me. I mean, you know, if he thinks he's going to be heading on anywhere else to fight, maybe you should think about heading on over to WWE because, you know, from what we saw in that fight, he really doesn't have what it takes to be in the UFC. And, you know, maybe you should stop worrying about his WWE shtick and persona and shit talk and concentrate more on fighting because, I don't know, I just found that whole main card kind of silly and so WWE-like. It's like, come on. Yeah. I mean, with, you know, with the shit that he did and then Rampage and then Tito, it's like, come on, guys. You know, you're making a mockery out of MMA. Yeah, I think that's uh, part of Bellator's... Uh selling point uh, you know they're trying to be more like the WWE to try and get more fans like that I mean you know it's less about the martial arts and more about the the gimmicks so I really don't like that well, yeah I don't either what about you Jeremiah yeah, it's the same the only other organization that I would let that pass was pride because they actually put on entertaining fights but I just basically fell off from watching Bellator here recently <clears throat> When it yeah, first came out, it was a good promotion to watch. Now it's just trash. Yeah, exactly. I'm with you on that because when they first came out, I loved the fact <clears> that we had another organization yeah. and that they were developing their own talent, but now they're going for the used WWE region, I mean the UFC rejects. So, you know, I hate to say that you know, those UFC fighters are rejects, but you know, come on, uh, you know, those guys that are now no longer in the UFC, they're not in the UFC for a reason, you know? Mm-hmm. I think Rampage uh, could still beat some of the UFC fighters, but um, yeah, I think he had a lot of problems with with Dana White and you know disrespecting and everything. Not, I think he wanted more money, wasn't it? He wanted more money, and that's why he didn't resign, or did was he let go? I can't remember what the hell the problem was with him, but I just got tired. I used to be a huge fan of Rampage, but I just got tired of you know the bullshit with him and his bad mouthing the UFC and. You know, come on, man. They stood by your side when everybody else was ready to throw you to the, you know, the loony bin there for all the crazy shit that he was doing, you know? Yeah, exactly. That, they really did stand by his side. I agree with you. You know, I mean, come on. They, they made him, I, I can't remember what the figure was, but it was well into the tens of millions of dollars he made working at the UFC, you know? Yeah. I still want to see Rampage and Tito. That'll probably happen. It'll happen. I want to see it, actually, myself. Kind of funny, though, that uh, Rampage doesn't want to fight his buddy there <laughs> for the uh, the title. And uh, he wants to fight King Mo again. It's kind of... <laughs> what, what is the point of that, you know? I don't know. Maybe he thought it was an easy fight, and he likes easy fights now. <laughs> Looking for another payday. Looking to get paid. I mean, pretty much, it's probably what he's doing. He's looking for the payday. I would pick Tito over Rampage. Nah, I don't yeah. know about that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I would go because it's so hard. Well, let's, a decision. Well, yeah, let's talk about Tito in a minute, but let's get to uh, the other upset there. Will Bur uh, Brooks versus Michael Chandler. 
Um, it appeared to me that Michael Chandler came out in round one looking to make a statement. He actually looked pretty damn good. He kept up a fairly decent amount of action and set the pace early on, but I wasn't as impressed with what I saw as what I was expecting to see because I was actually expecting Brooks to be dominated from the get-go, but I don't know. What did you guys think of that one? <laughs> that, that kind of threw a wrench into Bellator's plans for uh, Chandler, uh, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. I'm sure they were trying, going, were hoping to crown him the interim champ until uh, <laughs> he got the other matchup. But it, uh, Will Brooks, I mean, after the second round was over and he got into the later rounds, you could tell he was definitely the one dominating the fight. Um, you know, Chandler was was wrestling and doing a lot of stuff in the first and the second, but but Will Brooks, man, he, I. I don't know if you could call it an upset. Um, Clearly an upset. I mean, because you know, Dan I mean, Moore, I mean, like Dan, uh, Chandler was designed to be the interim champ, so they could lock in that fight with. Uh, no, I'm not, I mean, I, the fight was an upset, but I mean the the decision. I don't know if 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 you could really call that a, a upset decision. A bad oh, no, decision. No, 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 I, no. The decision was definitely not an upset because just like you said there, round one and two. I think the problem was is that Chandler came out expected to dominate. He put everything he had into those first two rounds, and you could see by the third round it, it looked like the pace that Chandler put on in round one and two, along with the damage that he sustained in, in you know in, in those rounds, and then uh, you know in round three where he you know took a little bit of a beating there. Um, a lot of people said that could have been a 10-8 round, um, but I think that just totally you know wore him out in that third round, and uh, you know and then when it came around to round four, Brooks clearly looked to be the fresh more crisp fighter in round four. And you know, I scored one and two for Chandler and three, four and five for uh Brooks. So on my scorecard I had a forty eight, forty seven, not an upset according to me because uh it looked like uh it was a split decision there with Will Brooks defeating Michael Chandler, forty eight, forty six, forty seven, forty eight, forty eight, forty seven. Um, I know a couple of the other sites actually scored it for Chandler. I went out and looked at MMA Junkie yeah. afterwards, and they actually were giving the fight to Chandler. So, well, you never know because a lot of judges and a lot of people look at the end of a round and and see that uh, more than they do the entire round. Yeah. In the fifth round, um, you know, Chandler did did look like he had Brooks uh, rocked and was controlling at the end of the fight. So yeah, but that was only like a minute and what a minute and a half or so into the the final. Yeah, a lot of times judges uh, actually see that, but they didn't this time. Yeah. Not saying it would have changed the outcome of the fight, but how much time did Chandler have to train for Brooks? I mean, it, it would be more more the other way around. How much time would Brooks have had to, to, to train for Chandler because Chandler was already training to fight um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. In a championship match, whereas Will Brooks is stepping into a five-round fight, where you know he called up on short notice. I mean, and I'm sure you know, it's I'm more sure it was an interim title bout, you know, at the last minute too. <laughs> yeah, it was more impressive to see what Will Will Brooks was able to do than what Chandler was able to do, knowing that he was going into a five-round fight. Um, yeah, and I know that you and I spoke on the on the last show that we did um, about you know the kind of circus atmosphere that Bellator is creating. But I mean, come on, this kind of like exposed them because you know damn well none of this shit turned out the way that they wanted it. <laughs> what am I talking no. about? <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of glad to see that, man. So it kind of exposes them a little bit more for what they are. I actually have one um, journalist that was following me, and when they listened to our show. <laughs> they unfollowed me because they didn't like what we had to say about fucking uh, Bellator. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't I have mean, much more time, Bellator. I, I mean, don't. certain certain journalists are, are going to try and uh, give you less credit if, if you don't see the other organizations as, as equals to the UFC, where the, they tend to have a bias against the UFC and, and hope uh, that these smaller organizations will will be bigger eventually, but you know yeah, the I talent, think, think the well, talent is there for a reason. Uh, it's, yeah. it's because the UFC uh, pretty much has has all the talent, 
And not well, all of it, talent. but they have the most of it. Yeah, they have the, yeah, the majority of the best talent out there. But I think what really pissed her off was that she actually did an interview with uh, uh, Bo- uh, Born Redney. And, uh, <laughs> you know, she was talking them up real good. And, I mean, come on. I mean, you know, that wasn't being... That wasn't being realistic, the interview that wow. she did. She was just praising them and, you know, sticking by the side because she got an interview with them, and she yeah. got fucking pissed at me because I spoke truth. <laughs> I mean, tell them, tell them aside, man. It's just a fucking joke. It's Not... kind of like Misha Tate, and, her, you know, if you talk about me or my friends, I, I'll block you on Twitter kind of yeah, thing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I was kind of upset that she blocked me and, and, and unfollowed me and stopped. It was like, oh, come on, man. Let's be real. Come on. You're an adult here. You don't have to fucking yeah. get all pissy like that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's talk about the last one here on the Bell Tour that we want to talk about here. Uh, Tino Ortiz versus Alexander Shemenko. What do you think about that one? Uh, it looked like uh, a giant fighting a dwarf. Um, yeah. Bad matchup. Um I don't think it really is a blemish on Shlomenko's Shul- uh, record because he's going up, and he technically probably should be a a, a welterweight uh, Small. by the by the size of the guy going up against a guy like Tito Ortiz, and still did pretty well until he got submitted. But he yeah, if you if you look at the size of the two, I mean it it, it almost looked like one of those old pride. Uh, Goofy fights. That yeah, well, yeah, it almost looked like he was two or three uh, weight classes above Shlomanko, didn't it? Exactly. I mean, it looked like he was fighting a dwarf or, or little people. Or but even so, man, he was actually doing quite well. I was like, holy yeah. shit, he's taking it to Tito, man. And then once... Oh, once Shlomanko's Tito, a beast. Yeah, I would yeah, love to was... see him. I would love to see him in the UFC. Yeah, Tito looked like the same old Tito on his feet. Shlomanko was, was winning the fight. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Tito kind of looked a bit sluggish there, but once he got it yeah. to the ground, it was all over because he was yeah. just way too big for us to make it. Like, yeah. You know, one, once he got that arm triangle in there, it was, you know, with that big old massive body on top of uh, Shlomenko, there was no way he was going to get out from under Tito Ortiz. It was just, Tito pulling his same shit after he won, I'm back. Yeah. I'm back. I just beat up a little kid. I'm back. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Well, Shawn Michaels not a little kid, but I mean, come on. If you yeah, and then that whole Hulk down. fucking thing that he did at the end. Oh, yeah, I was waiting for him. To, you know, I was waiting yeah. for him. Digging the, the grave. Tito would win. Doing the like, digging the grave and shit, and I mean. Uh, then he did the whole thing about little well, Hulk was my. My motivation for getting into the fighting, and it's like, come on. I know. I was commenting on something somewhere. They were talking about Tito. And I, I was like, I think he probably got syphilis from Jenna Jameson or something, because that oh, dude's like Jesus. fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, he's yeah. gone off the the deep end. He's he's not Tito of old, and he seems to think he is. Yeah. Yeah. I actually thought he was going to get hurt in that fight there, but uh, when I saw the two of them side by side, I was like, holy Christ, look at the difference in the size of those two fellas. Yeah, yeah I, when I had seen, seen it on paper, I wasn't really looking at the, the height and weight disadvantage, and when I seen him, seen him on screen, I was like, holy shit, this dude is way smaller than Tito. It had him listed as the same weight. <laughs> Yeah, but actually, yeah, I think what I saw is that at the weigh-in, there was like uh, five or seven pounds difference between the two of them. But it sure didn't look like that in the cage, did it? No, I don't know. I actually watched that fight. And Shemenko put weight on uh, for that fight, you know, so he was putting himself at a disadvantage in the first place to take that fight because that's not, I mean, like I said, he's more or less, uh, middleweight or welterweight fighting in middleweight. Yeah. Well, I guess that one didn't pan out because again, you know, I know you're saying you don't think it puts a blemish on his record, but it clearly puts a blemish on his record. It's a loss, but yeah. is that going to impact him in the division and his championship where he's at? No. <laughs> but uh, you know, that, that, I think that's what they were looking for. They were probably looking for over at Bellator to say Shlomanko beat the great Tito Ortiz. You know. Yeah, he almost did. He almost did. He certainly almost did. I thought he looked damn good up until, like I said, it went to the ground. And then once he, you know, got that big head on top of him, it's 
I mean, no. Tito's fucking head was almost as big as his old upper torso. <laughs> it almost looked, it looks photoshopped. <laughs> yes. Every time you see him, every video or picture, his fucking head looks photoshopped. So big. What the fuck makes his head so big? I've never seen a man with a head that big. For real, man. Have y'all seen Tito's younger pictures when he was a kid? What he looked like? I probably have. Long hair and a fro. He looked like Palomalu. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing. For the Steelers, that's the hair that he really has. That's what it looks like. Well, well, I'm glad he got the win anyway. Good to see him get a win, but uh, I don't buy all the bullshit that he spewed at the end of the fight there. And uh, Is he back? We'll see when he fights his next opponent in the right division. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think he is. No. Let him fight a, a light heavyweight and see how he does. Yeah. We'll It'll see. be him in Rampage. I, I do want to see that. I'd like, yeah, and again, I'd that's like probably... to see it, and I think Rampage would actually take that one. I'm not a big fan of Rampage or even King Mo, the steroid abuser. Both yeah. uh, Rampage and King Mo have got me blocked on Twitter. Do they really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Rampage. Rampage blocked me on Twitter. Yeah, what the fuck is this for Rampage to block you? <laughs> I had commented on something that Kenny Florian had said, and. I didn't know Kenny Florian and Rampage were in a were in a little argument, a little Twitter beef, and was commenting on. Uh, I had said that even Rampage had thought he had lost the the fight to Machida, and was surprised that that uh, he got the decision victory. And next thing I know, I fucking was blocked by Rampage. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Whatever, dude. And King Mo, he's got me blocked because I said he was a steroid abuser. That's understandable. But he is, so fuck him. <laughs> you know, he is. Oh, you remind me of that fellow over on that other website where he used to pick fights with fighters on fucking Twitter and he used to go at it and he'd be representing the fucking site that we were at. And he'd, have, was, the fuck, he'd, have, the logo and he'd have the logo for the site there and he's out there <laughs> arguing with fucking MMA fighters. It's like, what a fucking maroon. <laughs> no, I wasn't tweeting. I wasn't uh, tweeting. No, no, I'm just saying. No, I'm not saying you were fighting. I was. I was. Yeah, I, was, yeah. I wasn't <laughs> tweeting directly to him. I was, whenever I I'm responding to somebody else that is a, a friend of mine or whatever you want to call follower on Twitter, I I, I use the person's uh, Twitter handle, sure. and, you know, so they can see it. So it's kind of. One of those things where I know they might see it, but you know I'm not really trying to actually talk to them. I'm trying to do it more or less so if somebody doesn't know who it is, they can click on it, and it's kind of like giving a link on a website to where yeah. you're trying to explain something, but and you want people to be able to understand even more, so you give the link so they can look go to the link and get more information on that yeah. or the person. So it's I. I He's seen it and blocked me. Uh, he'll get over <laughs> it. He'll get over it. All right, guys, we've reached the end of the show here. Thanks again for joining me, guys. We'll do another post-event show on Sunday. And as always, you guys are welcome to join me for that one. So for now, it's time to say goodbye, fellas. I appreciate you showing up, and we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. Uh, do you have a time Sunday you're going to do the show? Because I work 7 to 7 again this weekend. Uh, I'm not real sure, but we'll work it out. And, uh, we'll work it out to work with your schedule, man. No, I mean, I appreciate you. Right. Take it easy, Rich. Take it easy, Jeremiah. All right, you guys have a good one. Okay, guys. Have a Catch great day, man. Okay. All right, bye-bye.